I think I'm loud enough to be heard, so I'm just gonna give it to you. Because it's like, hey, okay. Okay. <sighs> So I want to introduce you all to, first of all, to Bergson, who's doing the camera work. Thank you, Bergson. Thank Hi. You. Hey. I also want to introduce you to Fedna, who's doing the audio. Hi. Hey. They're very cute. They look like the best like lesbian hipster couple ever. <laughs> Sorry. <I think. laughs> um, this is the I think the fifth or sixth Olava live stream, Olava Talks live stream that I've done, and I hate doing them live stream because I really want to capture sort of like an intimate moment, to chill out with someone. But it's Alok, obviously, and I can't have Alok all to myself. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so I always start off with kind of explaining what Olava Talks is for the people who are for the first time uh, listening in or watching or uh, participating in it. Olava Talks is this concept I came up with about half a year ago um, because I was noticing that I was meeting all these amazing activists and these amazing thinkers and doers and artists um, in my work uh, and every time I would leave after like this amazing lunch or walking away from a demo or something and having this great conversation and thinking I have no record of this moment right and I have no way to share what these people um, think about and how they interact and how they sort of care for the world their hopes their motivations and and that always struck me as something that is a quite a loss so then I thought how about I just record it and do a, a kind of a podcast and just hang out with these amazing people and give them you know the space and time to really sort of um, really talk about what they care about what they're doing but also I don't know just get sort of the body into it in the struggle because I think we sort of have become disembodied we become concepts we become we become public figures we become our struggles but you know the person behind the bodies in there the the pain the the hurt, the hope, the laughter, sort of, it's sort of missed out, it's zoned out. And you see this, for example, in articles from like more mainstream media, they will call me and they'll be like, we wanna interview you. And I read back what they wrote, what I responded, and there's not, Olav is not there, right? And I worry, and I think a lot of activists, a lot of people who are doing important work kind of have that a lot. So I thought, I'm just gonna have a kiki with these people and y'all can join in. So that's the Olav Talks set up and we always have a little bit of food with Olaf talks at uh, this time because it's not at my house or something it's a little bit less elaborate i'm sorry and no spices <laughs> Us eating these vegetables is performance <laughs> <laughs> uh, alok i want to talk to you a little bit about alok i met alok um for the first time in real life uh, about a month ago now uh, i was in antwerp for the tgeu council the transgender yeah. eu council and they had been invited as a speaker, as a performer, and I was there as one of the participants of about 300 uh, people from mostly the West and about 40 people, uh, trans people of color were there. And I was very nervous, I really didn't wanna go actually. I was really kind of scared of ending up in this sort of, these, these conferences with only white trans people and just sort of having to explain things and be like, well, you know, that's a bit racist. And I was like, no, I don't wanna go all the way to Antwerp and, but <laughs> I don't want to go all the way to Antwerp to do all this work. And they had given me a scholarship so I could go there for free. And I was like, ah, I don't know, I don't want to. Because I wasn't going to pay for it in the first place. Very, <laughs> no, because it's also very expensive. Like, you really have to have some good amount of money, disposable income to join this TGU council. But anyways. Um, but I went there anyways because they, they told me like, you know, they, they kept sending me emails like, oh, we already bought your ticket. We already bought, we already reserved your hotel. I was like, okay, fine, now I do have to show up. And I get there and Alok, you were there as well with the, with the first, the caucus, the black caucus that was organized. So they had organized before the conference started a meetup between the people of color, the trans people couple who were attending before it had started an opportunity to meet one another. And you were there sitting there and it was very serious. I cracked you the late, or in other words, on time. I was very late. <laughs> Sorry. And I was cracking jokes about sex. Um, I think everybody can hear me, no? Do I need a mic? Yeah. Yeah, you want. Damn it. Hello. It's so authoritative, you know. I'm not <laughs> very serious. No, but I was cracking jokes about sex and about like how trans people should like fuck each other more often. And you were like, yeah. <laughs> 
We haven't yet, though, so I don't want to get into that right now. <laughs> and uh, what I thought was really interesting, because I'd seen you online, I'd seen your work, I'd seen clips of your performances, and I had no idea, like, how, again, this is a bit of that disembodiment that we go through, how extremely caring you are, and how, in a very short period of time, this community of, like, trans people of color coming from a bit around the world were lost, weren't sure where they wanted to be there, we were worried about having to do a lot of work, we were worried about being lost in the city they didn't know. Um, you managed to cement a community amongst us in these little gestures, taking us, like, finding for us, like, with the best place to eat, like, vegan food, like, you were doing this sort of, like, it was the Google Maps of ours, I like, like, no, let's go up there, and we'll all go, ending up at Club Strange, for example, I don't know, still don't know how you found Club Strange, Wonderful, wonderful little like old style gay bar that hadn't seen anyone come in for the last five years, I think. <laughs> and then we came. <laughs> um, and you, you were making sure people were, who were drunk were getting home, uh, paying taxes for people, making sure everybody had eaten because a lot of these conferences don't think about the fact that people get there but they don't have the money to pay for things in Europe, right? So. Um, because it's too expensive. And you were making sure that everybody had drinks and whatnot. And it was like, it was so amazing. It was such an interesting way of meeting you and getting to know you. And then you went on stage that two nights later and you absolutely murdered the room. <laughs> Every single white person who was in the room, I think, went home thinking, they don't like me. And <laughs> maybe I should tan more or something. <laughs> It was very intense, and, and again, you had made sure that there were spaces reserved for the people of color, that we could actually find a place to sit near you. You had made sure that we didn't have to say all these things. You had made sure that you started off the conference by making it very clear what it was about, how racism ties into their work as well, and their ambitions and their intentions in the work that they do. And yeah, so that's a bit where I was watching it, I was like, I need to have an Olavo Talks with you. <laughs> and find out, it's like, what? <laughs> How do you do all this? So, welcome. Help me welcome that, please. Thank you. <laughs> also, also, very welcome for like doing this for free because you know I have no money to give you, so I said that, right? Before I <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I wanted to start off by reading something. That, I, uh, that really touched me in uh, the book of poems that you have uh, published and you brought here that people can buy later after this. And this poem really touched me. And hold this one for a moment. Really touched me. It means a lot to me. And I'm, gonna to my I'm gonna try to read it without crying. That's a bit okay. the difficult part. Let me find the page page. Uh, where the side goes? Where is this? Yeah, there. Mike. Try not to cry. <laughs> Where do all the sad girls go? When the sun is shining, when the people are partying, when the country is celebrating, tell me, where do all the sad girls go? Try to love myself, but went outside and they, they punished me for it. Try to heal myself, but went inside and I punished me for it. Where do all of the sad girls go? In this world where we call people depressed and not disposable, as if trauma is something we chose and not the other way around, where do all of the sad girls go? When they told us it would get better, but it didn't. When they told us to try harder, but we couldn't. Where do all of the sad girls go? In this world that requires us to write poems about the people who have their hands wrapped around our necks for the very people who have their hands wrapped around our necks to recognize that they indeed have their hands wrapped around our necks? In this world where resistance is a requirement for survival? Progress, fairy tale to keep us sleeping, hope, the drug they won't stop prescribing. Where the only way to heal is to hurt, where the only way to heal is to hurt. Won't you tell me, where do all of the sad girls go? When, they only, when the only way to heal is to hurt. Another sad girl with a story about her world, world, of, world war of a body, 
that we cannot hear because of our own world war of a body. Won't you tell me, where do all the sad girls go? Talk to me about uh, sorrow. About sorrow. Um, well, as you're reading that poem, I, I thought about where I was in my life when I wrote it. I think in order for people to be proud, they have to displace shame. Mm -hmm. So I think in order for gay men to be proud, they put the shame on us. In order for cis women to be proud, they put the shame on us. And I think about what it means to be a repository for other people's shame. Because that, I think, is the experience of being queer, is having to bear the burden of other people's projection. And I think about how they try to make that our fault. Yeah. Call it dysphoria, call it depression, as if it's our failure and not their laziness. As if it's our lack and not their active dismissal. And I think about how, for me, sadness was never a feeling. It was always a structure of power. The reason that I was sad was because my life was under attack, not because I couldn't find happiness. And I think about how emotions have always been political for me. And I often joke, like, Taylor Swift is always going to have bad blood because she doesn't recognize that her only worth under white supremacist heteropatriarchal capitalism is to reproduce a white settler class. That's really sad, Taylor, you know? Yeah. And I think that that's one of the joys, you know, shout out to you, Taylor. Yeah. One of the joys, I think, of being queer and trans and gender conforming and racialized is that we learn from a young age that depression is oppression. And the language we have, to, the vocabulary we have to describe emotions isn't victim blaming. Yeah. Like when my friends tell me they're sad, I don't say smile. Mm -hmm. I don't say try harder. Mm -hmm. I say what can I do to help fight for you? Yeah. And I understand that sorrow is a natural reaction. And in fact, I think arguably one of the only reactions mm -hmm. to a world that requires people to die in order for us to live. You, 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 I feel like every time we talk, I should clap. <laughs> do you, do you, you all feel like, you all feel, whoa. <laughs> you talked about, you talk in your book as well about, um, sort of like what could have been, who we could have been in a world that wasn't, because I think for me, my sorrow has been a lot about sort of processing the fact that the little girl that I was, the little sort of non-binary, <laughs> girl that I was, never was given the room and the space to become, right? And now that I'm sort of like, after all these years of trying to be a dude, trying so hard, now that I've given up on that, like I'm only discovering now how much longer, like how, much, how many years I've lost um, getting to know and getting to like sort of cherish and nurture this little Olava that I was, right? And, I think my sorrow has, has also, also often felt sort of like something that could, that is, in, like, I don't know, that I could drown in, that, I could, that literally could take over and kill me, like could literally die of the amount of sorrow because it's in everything, right? Like the, the, the life I could have led is so drastically different, you know? There could have been such a celebration of, 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 of who I am and who I was and who I could have become. There could have been such a care for it. There could have been, but what I got was violence, like a lot. Like growing up, like my parents, my dad specifically, decided at a very young age, I think, because I was, I was, I was um, sort of like, everybody would come to our house, and we were like six children, and uh, I have one cis sister, and everybody would think that I was the girl. So people would come up to me, like when I was little, just tiny, they'd be like, oh, what a pretty girl you have. And I think my dad then decided like, oh, no, we ain't having that. So the violence started very early on, and and it was from cutting my hair because I wanted to have long hair, for example. It was disciplining me when I wanted to be with my aunts and my grand. I mean, it was constant. It became like, violence became the language of love. That's the way I know how to be loved, is being violated, right? And I don't know, when I saw you up there, like when you were, when you were performing, you talked about loneliness and how loneliness sometimes feels like it's killing us. I really felt that. I really felt that because I don't know how to be loved, 
you end up in this in the space of loneliness. Tell me about loneliness. No. <laughs> I like this like passing of the microphone. It's really straight. And with, with the like performance art piece of the salad. That we cannot do because it's priceless. Um hmm. I think first I feel compelled to say that I'm very sorry. Um, and I'm trying my best to help people like us, by which I mean everyone, to recognize that it's not that we could have died, it's that we did die. That um, when I was young too, I used to only wear what society calls girls' clothes, and I used to dance all the time. <laughs> it was kind of like a drag queen Bollywood belly dance fusion. Yeah, and I would just dance to my local Indian community in a small town in Texas. And then I remember the first time I experienced shame was from white people who looked at me and said, what do you think you're doing? You know? and, and race and gender were always economies of shame that were put on me. And I remember in that moment that I died. And I think that the problem with the Western imagination is it only sees death as a discrete moment and not as a, as a process. And I think that actually we have died and we carry ghosts in us and bodies are cemeteries. And those cemeteries are inherited because we take the deaths of our parents, 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 because they were too busy fleeing to process and we have to be burdened with the things that they didn't process. And so I just wanna say I'm sorry you died, but that's not the only travesty. The only other travesty is that we didn't have a funeral for that death. You know, I come from a place in India called Kerala, and we're kind of like matriarchal or whatever, and our family matriarch just passed away last week. And she was, I think, like almost 90. Um, and what I love about being home in Kerala is there's like six months of mourning. <laughs> it's like we're really committed to mourning. Wow. Like you're like literally like you're not allowed to have any joy at all. Like, or like literally like, like this is the saddest, most devastating thing in the entire world, right? And and you're you cancel everything. Wow. You cancel all of your plans and you're committed to that mourning. And I think about how the West has made funerals about family politics in bad fashion. And I think about how that's not mourning, and I think about how we're not even equipped with the tools to mourn, mm -hmm. and that actually we don't know how to have ceremonial funerals. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that the, the issue is that we died, and then we didn't even have a funeral after it, so it's like a double. Yeah. And when you don't have a funeral to say goodbye, you're haunted. Mm -hmm. And I think ghosts are real, and I think ghosts are haunting, and I think of all of the people that we could have been, and all the people that we lost are still there unless we say goodbye. And so a lot of I think what I try to do with my art practice is say goodbye. Because sometimes you have to lose things to find things. Mm -hmm. And I think so much of our, our emotional, psychic, and physical space is full of ghosts mm -hmm. and what ifs and possibilities. And so when I when I when I think about it, people don't know how to be free because they're so burdened from the past that when we offer a solution, they see it as poison because sometimes the medicine is understood as poison, right? People are afraid of the very things they've been, people are afraid of the things that have the potential to set them free. Yeah. And that, that's because they haven't healed. Yeah. And so I think that what I'm really trying to do more than anything in my life is like heal. <laughs> and that's like, I think like why, like um, I, made, I made a decision in my life to leave a lot of activist movements okay. because I didn't feel like they wanted to heal. And I felt like a lot of activism actually was interested in commodifying powerlessness. That the goal was never about ending oppression, but rather commodifying victim <coughs> narratives to maintain a status quo. But I wanted to be free. <laughs> and I wanted to be happy and not feel guilty for being happy. And I wanted to be alive and not feel guilty for being alive. Yeah. And I think that what art has allowed me to do is all of the work that activism pretends to do with a different sense of kindness. Yeah. Because being an artist has taught me that things are not what they seem to be. That people carry ghosts, and that people are deeply afraid, and that people are deeply lonely, which I think leads me to the answer to your question. I operate from the premise that our generation 
is more connected than ever and yet more alienated than ever. That I could at any moment of the day call you now through various apps and I could say hi and you could say hi and you would think that that would end loneliness but I think in fact it's exacerbated it. We suffer from a crisis of plenitude, meaning there are so many ways to go but all of them feel overwhelming. And so that's where I think that what I've been starting to realize about loneliness is the solution to loneliness is not company, it's justice. Like I think in the same way as I was talking about depression, like people think that loneliness and sadness are states of being that you can just change your status quo and then you're, you're fixed. But I think what I'm trying to get at is we're gonna continue to feel lonely and in fact we're gonna be in rooms like this, conferences like this, dance parties like this and feel lonely. Those are in fact the places I feel most lonely when I'm surrounded by other people. And I don't think of that as a paradox, I think of that as actually a commentary on how the only solutions for loneliness that we've given and the <coughs> poem you're referencing is about that is love. And I'm like, I don't want love, I want justice, yeah. you know? Love is easy. <laughs> yeah. And in comparison to, 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 to truly giving people justice, it's easy. They're going to say that they love trans people. Yeah. They're going to say that they love trans people of color. Yeah. But what they're not going to say is they love power more than they love us. Yeah. What they're not going to say is that they love being desirable more than they love us. Yeah. What they're not going to say is that they love their money more than they love us. And so I'm not interested in love. I'm interested in justice because justice would mean you would recognize that the reason I'm lonely is because I don't have the language to articulate my pain. You know, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so much positive to say right now. I hope I'm very glad to see this is why I did this recorded, right? Because these other people are reading, they're ridiculously brilliant. Or Thank you. just like ridiculously sleepy and jet lag. Okay. <laughs> like zones of consciousness. Where did you just come from? What you, what were you? Yeah, so after I saw you, um, I was in Johannesburg okay. for the International Trans Fund, shout out to them. And then I was in Cape Town working with some amazing artists there. Then I went to Kampala, Uganda, working with Transgender Equality Uganda. And then I was back in Joburg, and then I was in Mozambique and Maputo. And then back in Joburg, and now here. So actually, here is in like flew in this morning. Yeah, exactly. Then leaving right after. Yeah, and then leaving tomorrow. You know, like I think that speaking of loneliness, um, airports are my favorite place in the world because I was thinking about it today. I almost took a selfie in front of one. There was this area of the airport in Amsterdam where it was all of the discarded suitcases that no one that like people left behind, and I was like, who would leave behind a suitcase? Maybe that was my own shit. Where I was like. I would die because like my clothing is my everything. So like just thinking of these gold boots not making it here with me, it's like it's like losing a lot. Like, like the, so I just I wanted to enter the suitcases and be like, what is going? Like why do people leave this? And then I was like, wow, you know the narrative is probably like they forgot or like they like you know like oops I left my bag. But like what if people actually just left that shit and like started new lives? Maybe this is where my imagination goes. Maybe like you know what, girl, I'm done with tweet. That was last year. <laughs> Bye! But like tweet being a metaphor for like who I was. And then it was just like a graveyard, you know? And this, you know? They are just here in Amsterdam, like starting a whole new life. And I was just thinking about like, I was like, whoa. What I love about airports is, what I found, I, I wrote a poem about this the other day. Um, I, I think we need to argue for ephemeral moments. You know, I, when I think about like what I love about being queer, which is many things. I think what it's taught me is that ephemeral things, fleeting things, can be some of the most powerful things in the world. Like for example, um, when I am looking at myself in the mirror, when I have dressed up in the ways that I want, and I look at myself and I'm like, bitch, wow, yeah. <laughs> that is a type of happiness that no man will ever give me one. But then two, I could be beaten outside after that and so what I've learned to do is to find so much joy in that moment that when I am beaten, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I think that's what queerness has allowed me to do, is to take moments like this and to remember it forever, yeah. even though it's ending, but it's not. Yeah. And I think that um, what I love about airports is that when you see people say hello and goodbye, those moments are some of the most meaningful moments in the entire world. 
and when you're on a plane and someone's like, where are you going? You can just make up shit, you know? Like, I do that all the time. Like, I'm just like, whoa, I just make up stories about myself. And, like, and I just love it because it's like, whoa, yeah, like in this moment, I can be whatever I want to be, you know? That's so interesting. I have a completely yeah. different relationship. I have a very different relationship with, with, with airports. I hate them. Like with a vengeance. I hate everything about flying. I hate the waiting, the customs, the people that pat you down, the, the scans that you're like, I don't know what they're seeing, and the, the customs questions. I hate the fucking like, food. I hate the, how cold it is in planes. I hate how cramped they because I'm very, I'm, I'm a big person. Okay, so like planes are chronically too small for me. Like I hate everything about flying. And what is interesting is I also really have a lot of problems with, uh, with the ephemeral. I've grown up in a sort of, I think that ties into what you're saying about activism. Like there's a lot of about activism groups that I've also decided to um, not be part of and, uh, and, and, and not sort of associate with and you know, I don't like things that they're doing or share things that they're doing online, but that's about it. <laughs> um, because for me, what I find that there is oftentimes in these spaces, in these kind of communities and organizations, I see patterns of like, patriarchy reproduced of like, you know, like, who's an ableism as well, like, of who's the most sort of the bestest and who has the best analysis and who, who's the most convinced and who, uh, who's at every meeting, you know, and who's the best, you know, like, there is not a lot of space for the messy sort of and, and very insecure and unsure and, and for the chronic, well, I'm a big failure in life, like, I'm really good at that. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of, I enter these spaces and I, I feel like there is not a lot of effort in really creating interesting alternatives. Like, it seems to be the kind of places where the lawyers that I used to work with, I used to work at a law firm, and like the same attitudes of who's the best and who's, who works the longest hours and who has the sharpest analysis, I see that reproduced. So I'm like, is this really the alternative? Is this really what, how we imagine justice to look like? You know, like, how, you know, what are we really doing in terms of like saying that we want something different in the world when we cannot organize in a way that is inherently different? Where people, for example, who are not entirely sure what they're doing or why they're doing it and how they're doing, that they have a space to grow and, you know, sort of debate and think about it and try things out and, and, and sort of, and be vulnerable, you know, when, you know, like I, I have had instances where somebody told me like, oh, you promised you were gonna do this and this is totally unprofessional. I'm like, whoa, like, that's literally what my, like I had this lawyer that I was working with who told me, you know, as a trainer, he was like, I have to break you down before you become a good lawyer, you know? So like, the same attitude, like you have to be super professional. And so it like sort of, and I'm really trying to figure out a way to like reprogram myself because it doesn't feel safe, so I leave, but I wanna sort of build these different, uh, these different, um, alternatives, I want to help build them. But my problem is that I really have a lot of difficulty with um, with ephemeral moments, like you described them, these moments where, you know, in organizing spaces and in communities where we can be joyful, for example, where we can be silly, where we can be uh, uh, horny, where we can be uh, pained and unsure and lazy and all. I have a lot of difficulty with that because those are moments that I've been taught to be suspicious about. Especially as a feminine, as a black person, I feel like black joy is something that has been debased so much that it has been, that when you find yourself like, like I, I posted the other day um, a video of an of a African woman dancing to African house. I posted it on my timeline and immediately this white person goes like, wow, I get so tired of these depictions of these Africans as if they're all, they, they all, they're all dancing while they're herding cows. I was like, but... Yeah, I was like, but wait a minute, it was just really fun. <laughs> it was a great dancing person who was like really good at it. Like, can I not, can we not just be, the has, like, it is so, we have to justify because or else we're base, we're like these children, we're like, we need white people to come and sort of, and it's this, and also we like sort of fem joy is also very much, you know, like I take joy in looking cute but it's considered vain, and it's considered uh, deep, and I go into this organizing space where everyone wears black. <laughs> and I come in with like pretty head wrap, shiny toenails, 
and I can feel literally as I walk into the room that I am considered like just frivolous. Mm. She's out. She's, she obviously has got nothing in real to say because these are hardcore activists. And, but I, I don't know how to deal with the fact that I'm suspicious of my own ephemeral, ephemeral, well, my own sort of transient moments and, and where I can take joy from and where I can take pleasure from. But at the same time, when I don't have, when there's no room for it, for the way I feel unsafe and the way I can't sort of be part of that, you know? So what you're saying about, you know, sort of focusing on the ephemeral is quite brave because I know it's hard. Right? I just want to validate you again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, what you're saying is really real and it deserves to get a check mark. Yeah. Um, but I think this is where I'm saying art does what activism pretends to do. When we're watching someone in our community do art, as we did in Antwerp, we start screaming <laughs> and we're affirming them. And I think about how in activism I never got affirmed. I just got critiqued. Yeah. And I think about how in art, we actually practice the art of saying, I love you. And we say, you're giving me life, you know? And it's an ephemeral moment when someone is performing and the world ends and re regenerates again. When you look at someone and you think, wow, I'm transcendent. It's an ephemeral moment, but it's a moment that lasts when I think about wanting to die, or when I think about the people who want to kill me, I think about ephemeral moments. I think about moments like this. I think about moments where I feel real and moments I feel seen, and that's how I survive. And I think what I would say around like um, other people thinking that you're vain or don't work hard enough, like how can I help you and how can I help us not give a fuck what other people yeah. think? <laughs> because if we live our lives um, dependent on other people's insecurities because that's really what it is, then we're not actually living our lives, we're living theirs. <laughs> and I think I learned a long time ago, we can decorate jealousy, we can, we can put a nice cute outfit on insecurity, but at the end of the day, there's still jealousy and insecurity. And the thing about activists is that they politicize their jealousy and they politicize their insecurity and they make you think that you are the problem and not that they are hurting. And activism's misogyny is so deep that they have to pretend that they are powerful and strong and not fucking scared, terrified, and confused. And when I think about art, once again, what I'm saying on stage is I'm lost, I don't know who I am, I'm ignorant, I'm imperfect. Things that I would never say in an activist context where we have to pretend that we will win. Whereas in art, I don't think winning is the goal. I think being is the goal. Um, and so I think that what I've learned in my life is like, art gave me permission, and especially performance gave me permission to not care about what other people are thinking. Because at some level, I started to just perform, and I was in my own head, and I didn't really care. <laughs> but other people were, people walk out, I was like, bye. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I think I was so <laughs> interested in New York, three people fainted, maybe? Like, yeah. and I was like, oh, that's really sad, like, I hope we get some water, but like, I just kept going, like, I, I don't even notice. Like, I just literally am channeling me. Okay. And I really believe in vanity, actually, okay. you know? Yeah. Because, like, who the hell else is affirming gender non people of color? Like, no one, you know? So they're gonna, like, literally create, I don't know what it's like here, so I don't wanna speak to that, but in my country, they're gonna create hundreds of pieces of legislation trying to police your beauty from the public. Because let's be clear, this is about beauty. And they're gonna prevent you from being seen because they know that when people see gender non-conforming people, they see freedom. And when people see gender non-conforming people, they see an alternative. And that's why they cordon us off and throw us either in prisons or in gender neutral facilities over there or in academies so that our knowledge and our wisdom and our aesthetics and our healing are not viewed by the people, which is why I call my book Feminine Public, okay. because I will be here in public and not privatized. But I think what I'm trying to get at is, this world is so brutal to you, why would you not celebrate yourself and be yeah. vain? And this world is so brutal to you, how can we differentiate a compliment from a slur? Yeah. I think the thing about being trans that I learned from a very young age is that the very people complimenting me sounded like the people harassing me because both were rooted in making me a spectacle. Yeah. They didn't see me as a person, they saw me as a prop. 
and they saw me as an aesthetic or a metaphor or a symbol or inspiration for their own insecurity or inspiration, one or the other. And I, that's why I think that meeting you and meeting other transgender people of color has been so beautiful in my life because I think that you see me for me and not a spectacle. And that's given me the power to not care about what other people think. When I say I don't care about what other people think, let me be very clear, I don't care about what white people think. I don't care about what cis people think, but I really do care about what you think. And I think that the, that's a sense of ethics that I live my life by, is that who are the people who actually care about me? You, and therefore I'm gonna get feedback in that way, you know? I think, like, I, like what you're touching on, on beauty, like I have a lot of, I have a lot of difficulty with people, whatever I like, sort of like, post things online, on Instagram, or Facebook, there are certain ways, there's a particular politics of what people consider to be beautiful and brave, and what people just sort of ignore, right? So if I, for example, like, go off with makeup, and like for a party or something, and I, I get all these, oh my god, you're so gorgeous, you're so beautiful, all these posts, and like, I will post the next day something about, like, I don't know, having a fight with the municipality because they won't give me money or something, and reparations. But, um, and I will, I will like post something just straight from coming from, uh, from, and there's no one talking about how beautiful I am. And I, and I find myself having like a lot of difficulty with this, this sort of, because it, it feeds something in me. When I, I try to think of like, what, what can I do to keep getting this reinforcement that I'm beautiful? And the more I think about it, the more I'm like, but you know, is really beauty something, is that a compliment? Is beauty, like for a gender non-performing person, is that a compliment or sort of, um, like, are you trying to go me into a particular direction? Are you trying to tell me like when I'm valuable, when I'm valid, and when I'm not? Are you, you know, because it's not beautiful every day. It's beautiful when I am, you know, sort of in a particular um, uh, uh, representation of feminists that that they can sort of. And I feel like I'm, I don't know. I feel oftentimes I like I want to turn off the comments like on my Instagrams where I have most makeup on or most fat because I know that it does something to me. And I don't think that that what it does, that it's, that it's neutral, I think it can be quite violent, right? And there was someone who I had posted something about you on my Facebook, and there was someone who decided to be, and started off with like, I don't want to be transphobic or anything. <laughs> and then he started talking about like, yeah, but isn't it important to be um, something like, you know, if you really want to like defend your cause, isn't it important to be to present in a way that people can understand, and you know, in Dutch, the person said, het oog wilt ook wel wat. I don't know how to translate that the best in English. It's need what it wants. No, something like that, I also has its need, or something like, I don't know, it's, it, it was, and I deleted it because I'm like, I'm not gonna start this conversation with this person. But, um, yeah, I, I think, like, you, you write in your poem about, also about beauty, and I don't know, I have very strange, I don't wanna be called beautiful, you know, like, I think, just don't call me that, like, right? Once again, co-sign. Okay. <laughs> yeah, totally, because I have a line in, in, in this book where, what do we need to be desired for me and not my body? And I, I think about that all the time. Like, Western society sees the body as the locus of the self, and that's such a lie. <laughs> Sorry, you've all been lied to. Um, because what that does is collapse energy, spirit, ancestry. I occupy more space than my body. I carry the people that I'm from and the people that I love. And the reason I use they is not just because I'm gender neutral, but because I am plural. And I recognize my multitudes. And I recognize that what ableism as a structure is, is perpetuating the myth that we all have the same mind and that one mind is distinct from each other. It's so silly and wrong and lonely. And so what I really try to remember is that the body is a trap. And the reason that body positivity has become so popular is because what at the end of the day it's doing is still foregrounding the body. <laughs> so it sees itself as like um, somehow alternative or new, but at the end of the day, it's still about my body. And I think as gender non people, we offer an alternative because, truth be told, the body we've recognized will never be able to articulate what we're feeling. Because what we see is, if I put on makeup, then people see, but do they really see me? If I don't, then, and then we realize both 
polarities are part of the same system, which is you're making my appearance linked to my personhood. And I think that what love is, to me, is about saying, I don't know who you are. I don't, show me, you know? What, what love is to me is I could have the same conversation with you every single day for the rest of my life and still not know who you are, but I would still show up, you know? Love to me is about I can sit in silence with you for the next three days and like try to figure out who you are. Cool. Like we need to ambition beyond the body. And I think this is where I struggle a lot in trans community is that it's so, people tell me I'm not legitimately trans because I don't experience body dysmor dys dysmorphia like them. And, and, and I say, what? <laughs> Transness only became synonymous with the body, let alone genitalia, because of colonization, right? That actually, prior to the British conquest in South Asia, gender was not about your body, it was about your social role within a community. And in that way, gender was relational. It was not about identity, it was about community. And one of the first things the British did is they defined eunuchs by their absence of genitalia. And overnight, gender became body, became genitals. And so when we say that dysphoria is a prerequisite for being transness, that's another insidious way in which white supremacy operates. Because it delegitimizes millions of ways of being gendered across the world that were never and are never gonna be about the body. What I love, what I love about my people is when I'm home, they find ways to recognize me without embodiment. Okay. It's about small things like chores that I'm given, uh, narratives, that, names that I'm given. Like, gender as an ecosystem exists outside of just our body, you know? And also, if we make the body the only location of trans politics, then we're falling into the same private neoliberal logics that are fucked us up. So, okay, you're gonna let us change our bodies, but are you gonna let us go outside? <laughs> and I think what we see across the world in this country too, is that LGBT people only got victories by claiming to privacy and never the right to be in public. And that's why sex workers, and that's why gender non-conforming people, and that's why poor people, and that's why dark-skinned people, and that's why fat people, and that's why people with disabilities were thrown out because they did not have the privilege of privacy because their difference spilled out of the monogamous marriages, yeah. their difference spilled out of the places they should be partying. Yeah. And I think a lot about how, what I want more than anything in a movement is not the right to be beautiful, but is the right to just be. Yeah. And I think a lot of what I'm arguing for in the world is actually just literally just being able to just like walk down, you know, like walk yeah. down the street, <laughs> roll down the street, we crawl if you want, yeah. like, somersault down the street. Eat some nice seasoned vegetables. Seasoned yes, spices. spices. And just mind my business. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever, like we're at a park, yeah. there's parks everywhere, and we're cool. Yeah. I don't need to have to be beautiful to do that. Yeah. But right now in this moment, the only trans people we care about are the people who are beautiful. Yeah. The only fat people we care about are the people who are beautiful. Yeah. And what we're basically saying is, my empathy is incumbent on your beauty. Yeah. That's disgusting. Yeah. And I want to be able to be ugly, yeah. and I want to be able to be without thinking that my worth will be evaluated on how aesthetically pleasing you find me. Yeah. And I also want my relationship with my aesthetics to be recognized as an intimate journey with myself. Yeah. That's also some of the dynamics of misogyny, and me and my friend, we talk about this a lot in the past. People think we get dressed up for that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, like people will always be like, you're so attention seeking, like why do you care so much about your appearance? Like, maybe, I'm like, do you understand how much pleasure I give myself? Yeah. People are so threatened by self-pleasure, and I mean it in all expressions. Yeah. Because what self-pleasure basically means is I don't need your validation. Yeah. And when you are an oppressed person telling your oppressor, I don't need your validation, they don't know what to do with themselves. They don't know what to do. And so for me, my fashion has always been about me. Yeah. People ask me, girl, how did you keep going like, when you experienced so much violence, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I literally believe that other people are just stupid because I'm so fucking fabulous. Like, what? Like, I don't understand. Like, I just, like, literally, when people are oppressive to me, I'm like, I'm just confused. Like, what? Like, this is just factually incorrect. <laughs> like, it's like, I don't even understand, you know? And the way that I've been able to do that is because I celebrate myself, you know? And I think that this is what I wanted to say to you earlier before that I'm just remembering now. Like, girl, how can I help you celebrate you? <laughs> Stop caring about these 
literally mediocre people yeah. who are just literally putting pretty words around their jealousy and insecurity and just placing it on you. Yeah. Because your existence is a testament to so much power, beauty, non-beauty, ugly, disability, everything in the world. Messiness. Messiness. <laughs> and I, I, I feel like actually, I mean, this is something that I've really been thinking a lot, really been thinking a lot. One of the joys of being gender nonconforming, right? Because the only narratives we have of gender nonconforming is that we're failures, mm -hmm. is that we're delusional, is that we're in between, is that we are on our way to appropriate man or woman. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the joys of being gender nonconforming is people come up to me and tell me their secrets because, oh, we're running We have to look time. at time. How much was it? It's uh, at 17.30. Are you kidding me? Oh, wow. Okay, just give us a couple, give us 50 minutes. <laughs> I'll start that. People, people come up to me and tell me secrets all the time. Like, men on trains will come up to me and be like, I used to dress like you when I was younger. You oh, know? Really? People will tell me things about their marriages. People will tell me, like, all the stuff. Like, well, a lot of that, like, I didn't even know that, you know? But then I start to think about it, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Of course, the powerful people are the people we call crazy and ugly. Of course, the free people are the people that our society has taught us to fear. So why do we think we're gonna get validation? Do you think that James Baldwin got validation when he was alive? No, no. Do you think, what we do is we posthumously put Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera on here. When if you look at the footage, Sylvia Rivera was homeless. Sylvia Rivera, no one gave a shit about her. She was seen as too much, too radical, too ugly, too bold, too intersectional, too crazy. And then she dies and then people remember her. This is the legacy we come from. They care about us more when we're dead than when we're here. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, while we're here, they're gonna extract all of our knowledge, all of our aesthetics, all of our everything. And then when we die, they're gonna pretend that, that they care, they didn't care. And so I think what I really have learned from people like Marsha and Sylvia and from the legacy of trans femme of color resistance is if I don't teach the world how to treat me they're never gonna treat me in the ways that I want. Is that I have to not only know my worth, but double it. Is that I have to walk into rooms and teach people I am the shit. And I had to teach myself that fantasy is reality. Because I didn't have, and I don't have, access to structural power. They can put me on stages, but they're never gonna put me on TV screens, they'll call me a predator. They'll put me on stages, they're never gonna put me in politics, they'll call us a predator. They can put me on stages and outfits and runways, and, and magazine covers, but that's just because they want to pretend like looking at trans people is revolutionary when you haven't been looking at us in the time. I don't have structural power, but what I have is structural worth, because I know it myself. So I walk into rooms and I say, I am the shit, you know? And that's what I love about the girls, is that literally when they were getting criminalized in New York, and I worked with a lot of trans women, gender identity people who were at Stonewall, they tell me, when you were wearing more than two articles of clothing that were different than your assigned sex, you got thrown in prison. And then they would be thrown into prison and they would leave prison, dust off their heels, and go back out on the street again. And I said, how did you do that? And they said, why would I not? I loved it so good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Question, what do I need to become to celebrate myself? That's a good question. I think, like, I, feel, I find myself often, like, I'm, I'm, I really need people to help me with that, to be very honest. Yeah. Like, I really need it. Like, I, 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 um, like, I do agree that a lot of times when I go out on the street and I'm dressed the way I want to, like, I just don't understand why people get so angry about it. Like, right. literally. Right. This is so cute. <laughs> Are you not? Did you, did you right. not see what I'm saying right now? And um, and I think for me, like, what has been sort of the thing I've been trying to sort of put in my mind is that being gender nonconforming is kind of being like a wizard, like sort of which of being able to project, to fantasize and project yourself into different representations that you're not allowed to, to really be able to not only like do that, to, to project it, but then to step into that projection and make it real. Yeah. And I think like, people who are gender conforming, they're conforming, they're, they have been told this is how you're allowed to look like, and that's enough for them. And, and, and for some reason, like, they have no ability to project themselves into something else, you know? And, 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 and actually 
have the courage to step. I don't understand what what they miss, but there's a kind of magic to be to be gender nonconforming, and and I want to embrace that. But at the same time, I'm also I get a lot scared a lot on the street, um, and I know that I don't get as much grief on the street as most because I'm quite big and I think a lot of people look at me like I'm not, I'm not I'm too bad. I'm not, come back next week <laughs> and um, so I get that I don't but I get scared I see how they look and, and I've been you know like the other day I was, I was like wearing the shorty shorts like shorts that I've gotten and they're really cute it was really hot so I was like my butt out <laughs> I'm standing and waiting for the for the for the for the for the stoplights and the traffic lights and this car drives up to me and they start the guys in the car starts talking to me they're like hey buddy where you going and they're like oh nice man <laughs> but I was like, fuck, if I speak back to them like assholes, like what the hell, like I'm just, you know, like that could become, and they have a car, and it could do a lot of damage with right. a car, and, and, and you know, a bike, you know, they could just sort of, so I like, I'm just gonna pretend like I don't hear them, I have my, my day, and I go to the next stop, and they go along to the next stop, and they stop, and, and, the, and the, by the third, I thought that he was gonna step out of the car. And it was very confusing, and then, like I think a week afterwards, I was still not able. I wasn't able to dress the way I wanted to right. for a week afterwards, you know. And so I really, I need, I need like gender non-conforming people more than anything to help me sort of be in, on the streets and 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 to sort of try things out together. And like, there's nothing as fun as like a gender non-conforming that I know is gonna like to send me a message. I love that outfit. I'm like, see, I know you know. <laughs> I know you know. And and I guess I'm. I guess I'm sort of like, I wish I could really, sometimes I wish I had that sort of ability to be like, I think I'm cute, I get it, so I don't care what anybody thinks. Um, I wish I did, I don't though. There's nothing wrong with asking for validation. I just get so bored when people are like, oh, this person's needy, like they're, they're. I love needy people. Yeah, I, I never like, understand yeah. why people like think that like, being an attention, right. like a whore or something is that bad. I'm like, I, yeah, for attention. I deserve attention. I don't, I yeah. Like, but I, I think the, hard the difference it. is it's, it's we get validation and attention from people who actually care about us. I, I do a performance art piece where I run into a wall over and over again. I have a mattress that I wanted to run. And I call that man because I kept running to men for validation for a very long time in my life. <laughs> and I was like, this one's different. This you know? like, we're we're in our own. It's really for me. I'm oh, doing your fuck being able to get a wall again. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I started running to other trans and gender nonconforming people. Yeah. And I started saying, I feel ugly. I feel dysphoric. I feel confused. I feel lost. I feel scared for my life. I feel like I could get bashed tomorrow and no one would care. I feel like I could get murdered and they'd call me a man and no one would care. I feel like there are hundreds of thousands of white women who are believed, yeah. and I am not. Yeah. I feel like I'm never believed. And then those people said, everything you're experiencing is real, what can I do for you? Yeah. And that's what I tell us as TGNC people, why do we think that the people who have their hands around our neck will ever hear our scream as a scream? They hear it as a song. They have been primed to see us as cultural entertainment. So that even when we're dying, it's fodder for their NGOs. Even when we're getting bashed, it's fodder for their media reels. The only people who really see it for us are the people who know what it's like. I know what it's like to be complimented and to be afraid that they'll kill me next. I know what it's like to not be able to tell if they want to fuck me or be me or kill me. I know what it's like to actually enjoy being harassed because I'm being gendered appropriately. I know what it's like to hold all of that. And so when I say you're beautiful, I don't mean it the same way those people mean it. I don't mean it as in you're entertaining, you're approximating white femininity, I see you're intelligible to me now. I don't mean it as in like, wow, you're an inspiration, you're so great. I mean it as in I know what you've been through and I'm fighting for us. Thank you. <laughs> that was a close like well, yeah, now we're done. <laughs> no. um, I don't really take questions, I'm sorry. And I think, especially after what we discussed and how we discussed it, I don't know if I could really handle questions right now. How do you feel about that? Yeah. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah. Whew. Thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you so much for sharing 
so much <laughs> and for inviting and, and, and being inspirational to me anyways, especially on that stage in Antwerp where I was like, I, one day I will do that in my life. I will make a whole lot of white people angry and get paid for it. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Erickson, and thank you, Fanna. Listen and support trans people of color yes. and support Trans United Netherlands, right? Yes. Let's get a round of applause for them. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I also have some of my books to vote for you if you'd like to get one. I'm going to be over on that table. Thank so you. So do you want to do you want to say something about the schedule? Like, uh, uh, Dina, yes. Okay. But we're, we're shutting up. We're done, right? Yes. And then Dina can explain to you what the setup is for tonight for the people who want to stay for the event tonight and the people who are going to go home. Yeah.